Good morning. Wow, that was pretty good. I thought I'd have to resort to the Lord be with you. <laughs> uh, welcome to our second annual Ministry Resource Day. Uh, we started this last year with a desire to um, reinforce or remind you that the seminary is here as a resource for not only for our students as they come through, but for our graduates and all those who are holding congregational leadership lay or ordained in our territory. And so our hope is that each year we can invite you to a day of conversation and presentations and worship and renewal, uh, and that together we can live into this changed and changing world as Christ's faithful church. Um, we're able to make this year's event possible for you uh, because we've had several sponsors. It's sponsored by LTSP, of course, but also we're really grateful for the support and partnership with the Philadelphia Theological Institute. Also, the Episcopal Diocese of Philadelphia uh, is a co-sponsor, and we're excited for that support. And the Southeast Pennsylvania Synod of the ELCA is also here supporting us, so we're grateful for that as well. Here's where we're gonna start with just simply the theme. And uh, what I've called this is digital pluralism and the death and resurrection of the church. If you haven't heard that term, digital pluralism, pluralism. Um, you're not behind the times. You're not out of it. It's not that you haven't been paying attention. I, I made it up. <laughs> I find it really helpful. Perhaps you will too. It's uh, something I've been kind of working on and around for a few years. In fact, I've probably worked on some of this material with you in different groups and you can see if you remember what I said or if I've changed at all or developed. Um, but it's kind of what's been haunting me or really informing the way I think about church and ministry the last few years. And I'll back up a little bit to tell uh, a story about how that happened. So five or six years ago, I was invited to lead a uh, Lilly Endowment sponsored grant that drew together five seminaries from five different Christian traditions to investigate the question of vocation. Uh, and the, the seminaries were Luther Seminary for Lutherans out of St. Paul, the Catholic Theological Union, Roman Catholicism, uh, Chicago, Princeton Seminary, the Reformed Tradition in New Jersey, uh, Duke Divinity School, the Wesleyan Methodist Tradition, and Fuller Theological Seminary in California, the Evangelicals. And the grant got started when we had done some pre-grant work and some research around this question of of our graduates. And uh, we wanted at first to know with five different traditions, we wanted to know, do we share enough of the same language to really make this a meaningful conversation and study? And, and we found out really quickly we did by surveying graduates and constituents of all five schools. We also found out, and this was really very encouraging, we found out that most of our graduates, I mean an overwhelming percent of our graduates, identified vocation, uh, the God's calling to all the baptized, as primary to their own theology and their preaching and teaching in the church, which is all to the good. We did a second level of surveys, though, and interviews with parishioners in these different congregations, and we did some literature surveys and reading, and what we found out really quickly was that most of the people coming to our churches do not identify what they spend most of their time doing as a calling from God. And so that created this kind of real disconnect in question. How is it that you have a generation of leaders saying vocations at the center of their theology, preaching, and teaching in a generation of Christians who can't imagine that what they do with their lives is of interest to God and the church. Um, and so that's where that question went. And the first kind of exercise the five schools undertook was to come up with a theological definition of vocation out of their own tradition, right? The idea was to mine the riches of these five rich traditions. Uh, and our group uh, was not all Lutheran, but... Um, but we were working on this together out in St. Paul and uh, very quickly had a definition. Actually, the first to the, to the beat was the folks from Duke. They sent around this gorgeously worded Methodist understanding of, of uh, vocation. And we're all a little bit awe, a little bit nervous about if we could do as well. Um, we came up with a definition, several definitions actually, and none of them satisfied. And it wasn't that they were theologically inadequate. We sort of felt like we could send any of these to the Council of Bishops and they would give their approval. The problem was one of us would read it and we'd all nod our heads and then find ourselves caught up in a collective yawn. And we thought, well, that can't be good. <laughs> we are bored by our own theology. <laughs> Maybe that's part of the problem. At which point, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Andy Root, who was here last year as the, uh, one of the presenters for Resource Day, 
Uh, Andy, I like to say, is one of the most astute students of culture that I know, which really means that he watches way too much television. <laughs> But Andy said at that point, he said, you know, we're, we've identified vocation as an identity term, right? To think about yourself as a child of God, called by God to service in the world. Those are identity categories. Are we assuming that people are making their identity, crafting their identities, and making meaning the same way they were a generation ago? Um, or as one of my other colleagues, Rolf Jacobson, said, we're interested in how faith connects to daily life. Are we sure we still know what a daily life looks like? in the 21st century. So that sent us on a, a kind of a year-long detour where we took a break from the formal work of the, of the grant and instead started kind of delving into the culture, which sounds odd, of course, because we live in this culture. But what we realized was we don't always live in it as professionals. Right? We may interact and watch television and do banking electronically and commerce and all kinds of things, but somehow it's easy to kind of be so enclosed in our theological systems that we sort of separate that or buffer that. And so our goal was to kind of see if we could get over that hump, burst the bubble, dive into the culture as, as practicing theologians and pastors. Um, and so we started kind of reading books about the culture and cultural trends. We started watching TED Talks. We started reading articles and we'd meet monthly to kind of talk about what we were learning. Um, and by the end of that year, I had actually lost a whole lot of confidence in what I was doing. Um, because it, it felt like, and it's not that what I had been doing as a preacher or as a teacher of preachers was wrong at all. It felt more that what I had been trained to do and had been training people to do, that the population for whom that worked best seemed to be shrinking. And the population for whom that did not seem to connect seemed to only be growing. And so creative for me, what I've called uh, on occasion a fruitful vocational crisis. I mean, it really has been incredibly fruitful in terms of reorienting my own theological inquiry and perspectives, um, very much about my vocation as a preacher and a teacher of preachers. Um, and at the same time, though, it really did feel like a crisis. I mean, at that point, I'd been preaching for more than 20 years, teaching preaching for 10 years. I was thinking I knew what I was doing. And all of a sudden, I wasn't so sure anymore. So part of the reason I'm really grateful for you being here and for our time to talk about this together is because, quite frankly, I am tired of suffering alone. <laughs> and I would like to invite you into my fruitful vocational crisis so that we can struggle with this together. Because there's two things actually I'm pretty convinced about. One is that nobody in the church right now knows exactly what will be called of us to give, give a faithful testimony in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Nobody has that figured out. Um, if I had it figured out, so I'm just warning you, like, don't look for all the answers. If I had to figure it out, I'd be working on my second bestseller <laughs> from Hawaii. <laughs> um, so I'm pretty sure no one has it figured out, but I'm also absolutely convinced that in the church, and I'll actually be more bold, in this very room, God has blessed this group, this gathering, with sufficient gifts and grace and experience that aided by the Holy Spirit, we will find a way to give fit testimony to the gospel, to our treasure in this time and place. Um, so that's where a whole lot of this got started. Uh, and so what I want to th kind of unpack with you is sort of, sort of the dimensions of this crisis. And I think some of these elements, it won't so much be that it's new, but hopefully there'll be some names or frameworks to help you think about, uh, about the things you've been experiencing in, in your life as well. Um, so I want to begin with a question I think haunts a lot of us, uh, particularly if we have memory, long-term memory in the church, or even have heard our parents or grandparents' stories about the church, and that is, where have all the people gone? And to do that, I'm going to share the story that I've told more times in more places, uh, but it just, for me, captures where we're at. And it's a story about a colleague of mine, uh, Raleigh Martinson, who, uh, <clears throat> for a number of years, was uh, the pastor, professor, interested in theology for those in the first third of life, so youth and family ministry. Um, and this work would take him kind of all over the world. And a couple years ago, he had just come back from some presentations, some work he had done in Australia, and wanted and shared the story with me. Um, so he's getting on a plane. He's beside a guy who he said was about, about my age, um, you know, late 20s. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> All right, middle-aged, <laughs> um, and he knew he had about a 15-hour flight, and so he wanted to get to know the guy beside him. I don't know if any of you have met or heard Raleigh Martinson speak, but there's a couple things that will put this whole story into context. 
Raleigh is uh, the extrovert's extrovert. Uh, he's insatiably curious, and he loves the church. So after introducing himself, hi, I'm Raleigh Martins, and he turned to the guy beside him, and he said, so I'm wondering, do you go to church? Right, this is where the extrovert's extrovert comes in. Can most of, I can't imagine asking that to someone. In fact, when I'm on a plane, usually there's a different little uh, mantra that's going through my head, which is something like this. Please don't ask me what I do. Please don't ask me what I do. Please don't ask me what I do. Because like, for just a little while, I want to leave the problems of the church literally 40,000 feet below. Um, but not Raleigh. Do you go to church? And the guy is totally unfazed. And he says, you know, it's interesting you would ask me that because my family and I are talking about that right now. We've gone to church our whole lives, but lately we've been reconsidering whether it's worth our time. And so Raleigh, being Raleigh, insatiably curious, said, tell me about that. And he did. He backed his story up a full year earlier. And he said, you know, year, this all happened in August. A year ago at this time, uh, we were heading into a new school year and program year. They had kids in middle school and elementary school. So we were so excited for what was coming. Um, at work and at home, and just really excited about a, a new fall, that kind of back-to-school excitement. He said, what we discovered was halfway through the fall, we felt incredibly overwhelmed, just overcommitted. We dragged ourselves through Christmas, we barely made it through the spring, and we realized we were suffering from familial burnout. Um, that between all the commitments at work and home and social and school and church, they were just overwhelmed. And so on the, on the Sunday before, this gentleman's business took him to Australia, after church, he and his family sat down, uh, and they had what in our home we call a family council. Usually for us, it's also August, and we're setting like bedtimes and allowances and chores with the kids. Um, this family was gonna talk about their crazy busy lives and see if they could do something about it. So they made a list of all the activities that they were a part of. And then they went down the list and discussed whether it was really worth their time. Which ones were essential, and which ones should they stop? They talked for more than 90 minutes, and when they were done, church hadn't made the cut. The guy confessed to a little embarrassment. You know, I'm, I'm really sort of surprised and a little sad that we have came to that conclusion, because my parents always brought me to church. When my wife and I had kids, we brought them to church. But we realized we're just not getting that much out of it. They're still doing Girl Scouts, by the way, because they can see the tangible difference Girl Scouts makes in their daughter's life but not church. And the reason that story for me is so paradigmatic is I think all kinds of people are, are experiencing a similar reality, coming to a similar decision, often with far less intentionality. Um, and if we're not sure, what we have to do is remind ourselves of some of the stats. Right, I'll only do this once, I promise. Um, and this is, this is like 1970 to 2000. We're not even talking about the last 15 years. But this is attendance from, from 70 to 2000. Uh, it starts at 100% because wherever you are then is wherever you are. And uh, the major mainline traditions, you follow them over. Um, I'll talk about my tribe just for a moment. The Lutherans are the little purple dot at the top. And over those 30 years, as the population increases, the best things Lutherans can say is we're declining just a little slower than everybody else. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> right, and of course, the last 15 years have been devastating. The first decade of the 21st century, it wasn't only mainline that began to look like they were in free fall, but all Christian traditions declined. Not one major Christian tradition in North America stayed the same or grew in the first decade of the 21st century. Um, so that's that question that haunts a lot of leaders and congregations, kind of what happened, what went wrong, um, what are we gonna do? And before we go further, there's one thing I wanna say, and I wanna say it really clearly. And if you don't remember anything else, Remember this, this decline, this is not your fault. This is not your fault. Sometimes I feel a little presumptuous, like who am I to say whether this is your fault or someone else's fault? Um, but the thing is, the last six or eight years or so, a big part of my career has been out and about with pastors uh, at conferences and at workshops and assemblies and gatherings, and I come away every single time just so incredibly impressed by and grateful for the faithfulness of the leaders I'm gathering with. It's really important for you to know that you are no less faithful or hardworking or creative than the generations came before you. This is not your fault. And I think part of the issue around clergy burnout is because when you keep working harder and harder and harder for diminishing returns, it's really hard not to conclude that you're doing something wrong and you're not. 
what then is going on? Well, I think as we started discovering when we were thinking this through as a study group, uh, that the whole world has changed dramatically in a very short time. And that's what I wanna get at. Um, to get at that though, I wanna back up a step or two and set a framework. And to do that, I wanna talk about what I describe as the storied nature of our lives. And to do that, I wanna put these uh, pictures of two wine glasses in front of you. Um, and I want to just have you look at those for just a moment. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing that you won't be surprised to discover that one of those glasses is, is more expensive than the other, right? Just by looking, which would you guess? One of the left, something about it. it seems thinner or finer, wouldn't be surprised it's more expensive. Would you be surprised to find out it's that much more expensive? Right, which immediately prompts the question, at least for me, who in the world would buy a $70 wine glass when you can get by with more or less the same thing for 225. Now, judging by the number of people in this room, I'm guessing five of you could answer that question. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 we're with Episcopalians. Seven of you could probably <laughs> answer that. Now, I won't out you, um, but a lot of us are kind of thinking, like, why? Uh, and, and the answer is actually has a lot to do with story. Um, in my time away, like when I took that year off from the formal research and did some other research, um, I got really curious about story and the way story impacts life. And so I took a break from reading systematic theology and biblical studies for a year. Yeah, it was a happy, happy year. No, I'm just, <laughs> just, just kidding, John. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, <laughs> I'll, I'll hear about this later. <laughs> um, and I started reading, I started spending more time reading some of the great storytellers of our generation. Not just persons, but sort of the industry of storytelling. So I started reading uh, stuff from scriptwriters and uh, directors, uh, video game designers and advertisers. People who are crafting these large influential stories and the impact they had. And, and one of the folks who's, who's been really helpful for me is a guy by the name of Seth Godin, kind of a marketing guru. And one of Godin's central arguments to his work is that we're constantly making decisions based on our interaction with stories, the way we bring our story to bear on the stories in front of us. And so what Godin would say is our decision about how much to spend on a wine glass and almost everything else is dictated primarily by the story we perceive behind these wine glasses, which is an odd thought. These wine glasses tell stories. Um, if they don't, in and of themselves, the, the way they're advertised and marketed and packaged does. So I want to start with the one on the right, the cheaper wine glass. This is a picture from uh, Target.com, advertising that very wine glass. And when you think about it, now think about what the story Target is telling you is all about. Well, this is a story about a life, and it's about a pretty good life, a comfortable life, a leather chair and plants and books. And what Target is hoping is that you look at that picture, which is really a story, you'll find yourself putting yourself into it. And imagine coming home after a, a vestry meeting or a church council meeting, or maybe teaching confirmation, <laughs> and sinking into that leather chair and reaching out for that half-filled glass of buttery Chardonnay and lifting it up and thinking, you know what? Things can be challenging, but this is a good life. Right now, the thing about stories is that in, at the heart of every story is also a promise. So the behind the story is a promise, and the promise is pretty clear. Do you see this life? This good life, this good life can be your life for just $2.25 a glass, <laughs> right? Now, the other glass is telling a story, too. It's made by an artisan glass blower by the name of George Rydell. That's why it's so expensive. Each glass is hand-blown. And if you go to the Rydell website, you'll find lots of gorgeous pictures also. But I thought the story Rydell was trying to tell about his wine glass was captured more by a single tagline. If the wine matters, so does the glass. It's that simple. Now, I just have to take a break and ask real quick, is anyone else bothered by the fact that that comma should be a semicolon? Yes. <laughs> right, all right, so, right, grammar nerds unite. We, we are a tribe. <laughs> all right, so, not the best grammar, but great story. Now, I find this kind of question about, about, yeah, I find this question about wine glasses and wine really interesting. There's actually two sets of scientific research that come to bear on this, surprisingly so. One is from that group of scientists we call chemists. And chemists can demonstrate beyond a shadow of the doubt that if a glass, two glasses are made of the same material, more or less the same shape, they have no impact or effect on the taste of the wine. It just doesn't matter no matter how much money you spend. 
There's another set of scientists, though. We call them psychologists, <laughs> who have also proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you believe your glass affects the quality of the wine, it does. It does, and suddenly, like $70 for a wine glass, if it makes you believe all the wine's better, the rest of the wine you buy for the rest of your life is better. Not a bad deal, right? So this is kind of Godin's point all along, that, that, that uh, our perception, the stories we are telling ourselves greatly shape our realities. One experiment that I think was, I mean, if, if I wasn't doing what I was doing, I think I'd love to be a social psychologist. They just do the most fun experiments. Um, one of such experiment was when they created a common kitchen and had two dining rooms on each side appointed in the exact same way. So same silverware, crystal, plates, linen, same servers, same chef. Everything's the same except for one thing. One of the groups is told that the wine being paired with their meal comes from Northern California. The other group is told that the wine being served with their dinner comes from North Dakota. <laughs> And I like to add that when you're from Minnesota, that's even funnier. <laughs> All right, now it's actually the same wine. They're just told it's different. And then afterwards, they're asked to rate not the wine or the meal even, but the competency of the chef. And they discover that the folks that thought their wine was from Northern California rate the chef as significantly more competent than do the other folks. Story impacts reality. And this was kind of Godin's idea that he wanted to tell. He wanted to work with advertisers and say, stop trying to sell us stuff. Instead, tell true stories, good stories, and pitch them to people who are interested in, in following them and inclined to believe them. And he took this idea. What he wanted to write this book was called All Marketers Are Storytellers. He took it to the publisher. He said, it's a great book. Wrong title. It won't sell. So they changed the title and instead called it All Marketers Are Liars. Important subtitle. The, the power of telling authentic stories in a low trust world. Um, they got this title, All Marketers Are Liars, from a, a chapter, beginning of a, a chapter in Godin's book, where he begins rather abruptly by saying, you are a liar, and so am I. And they're going to explain that we're constantly telling ourselves stories that whether we know are true or not, influence. In fact, sometimes we know they're not true, and yet by believing them, they become true in our experience. Um, so, Think for a moment, just another example from the world of marketing. Think about what's probably one of the great marketing failures within recent memory. I had someone call out the Edsel once. <laughs> I was like, that's not my memory. <laughs> New Coke. Do you remember? So a little bit of the story behind this. Coca-Cola owned the lion's share of the cola industry for years. In the 70s, they found themselves trailing, particularly in open market settings and supermarkets. People could choose what they want, and they got nervous. So they commissioned uh, the, a nationwide taste test to discover what was going on, a, a blind taste test. Blind taste test isn't drinking with blindfolds, that could be messy. Blind taste is simply when they pour a couple different colas into small plastic glasses with no identifiers and you drink it and say, what is your favorite? And so that's what they did. And the research came back and it was really clear. The reason people, they were losing market share to Pepsi was because people like Pepsi better. <laughs> right now remember, this is Coca-Cola's own researchers. So now they're really worried and they want to do something. And what they decide to do is, is pretty understandable. They decide to become more like Pepsi. The big difference is sweetness. Pepsi's sweeter, so they make a new Coke formula that's sweeter. And they release it to the fanfare, a $100 million advertising campaign, and it totally bombs. Why? Like, it makes total sense. Why? Because what Coca-Cola forgot is that we almost never drink our cola in little plastic glasses with no idea of what we're drinking. We drink our cola, we have the can. Right, or the bottle, or the vending machines behind us, or it's printed in the menu that we ordered it from. There are constant reminders of what it is we've chosen and all the stories that go along with it. So we're drinking cola and we're remembering jingles like it's the real thing. Or the, who remembers the claymation polar bears at Christmas time, <laughs> right? The dancing polar bears. Um, so when you're drinking Coca Cola, you're not actually just drinking chemicals. Okay, you are just drinking chemicals. <laughs> But you are also drinking stories, and you're drinking Santa Claus. I don't know if you know this, but in the 1920s, Coca-Cola faced another marketing challenge. Uh, up until that point, it was a popular beverage, but it was drunk only in the summer months, and they wanted to become a year-round beverage. And so they hired a Swedish-American artist uh, for a 10-year-long advertising campaign. Like, it's inconceivable now, any ad campaign would run that long, but they did. For 10 years, they hired him to paint what I would describe as Rockwell-esque pictures of Santa in various 
poses and positions holding a Coke. Remember the naughty and nice list and all those other pictures that are still kind of with us. Now, this advertising campaign was so successful, it had two outcomes. One was that, in fact, after it was done, Coke was drunk all year round. The other was that prior to this advertising campaign, there was no uniform picture of Santa in the American consciousness. Right? There were a lot of different imaginings of Santa Claus that could be traced back to the different ethnic communities that had, that had come over and brought it with us. So if you were coming from England, it was Father Christmas. If it was Germany, it was Kris Kringle. If it was the Scandinavian countries, it was what they would call trolls or what we, we would call elves. Right? Remember the night before Christmas? St. Nick is described as a jolly little elf, right? That's how he gets up and down the chimneys. This guy, like, forget it. <laughs> um, so when this ad is done, there is, for the first time in the North American consciousness, a single picture of what Santa looks like, and he looks just like that, and has ever since. Not coincidentally wearing Coca-Cola's colors. <laughs> um, so that's what went wrong with Coca-Cola. They started messing with our stories. When they told us it was a new formula, they got people upset about the changing of the story, and that's why it flopped. They did studies later to see if they had just changed the formula and introduced it, if people would notice, and they thought probably wouldn't have, but they messed with our stories. And this is kind of Godin's point. Stories are really powerful, that we're constantly telling them to ourselves. It's not just about what we drink, it's where we shop. If you go to BJ's or Whole Foods, you're probably telling yourselves two fairly different stories. Um, at BJ's, it's something like, I love the the variety, I love the economics of it all, I want to make my shopping dollar stretch, uh, and I love the kind of choice and the ability to buy in bulk, right? That's kind of all that goes along with the kind of economical food shopper. The other story that you tell in Whole Foods is going to be really different because things aren't cheap there, and you don't buy them in bulk because you can't afford them, <laughs> right? You know the nickname for Whole Foods? Whole paycheck. <laughs> right, and, it, and so if you're going to Whole Foods, you're telling us of a different story that goes something like, I like organic, I want to support community agriculture, the local farmers, and for all these reasons, it's worth the premium that it costs to shop at Whole Foods. Or cars. You might drive a smart car because you're like, I want to make my commuting dollar stretch and I care about the environment, even though there are bigger cars that get better gas mileage. Or you might say, well, I can't really, if, uh, I'd love to drive a smart car, but I've got little kids. I, I'm all about safety. I need a small SUV even though small SUVs are among the most dangerous cars on the road because they're not classified as cars, but like trucks, different safety standards, and their shape makes them more likely to tip over. Right? We tell ourselves these stories and they inform profoundly the decisions we make, whether we know it or not. So what I wanna kind of help us think about is that we have been trained to think about the, the, our species, humanity, in anthropological terms as homo sapiens, thinking beings, actually homo sapiens sapiens, beings that can think about our own thinking. Aren't we awesome? I want to instead invite us to think about ourselves as homo neurons, as narrative beings, as people who are constantly thinking and dealing in, with, and through story. Right? So the heart of this all is that finally stuff, and by stuff I mean everything, makes sense only in story. Three quick quotations pulled out of context to give you a sense of that. You might get it right away, just hold on to it for a second. First one, you ask, what is our policy? I can say it. It is to wage war by sea, land, and air with all of our might, with all the strength that God can give us. That is our policy. All right, now, if you did not know, if you didn't recognize that quotation, you might be forgiven for thinking, this is someone who ever said it that you maybe don't want to have lunch with, <laughs> right? Kind of belligerent. What's this talk about war and God? Is this someone from ISIS, a terrorist? It's Winston Churchill. It's the part of his first address to Parliament uh, in 1941, and in that context, with that story behind us, you hear those words very differently. It's one person trying to summon a whole nation, bolster the courage of a nation to face down their greatest threat to democracy. Context makes all the difference. The story makes all the difference. Second one, I, that I'm sure you'll get a little quicker. <laughs> right? You're laughing because you haven't only heard it, you've probably said it, right? You're out driving with friends, you're talking away, and you're suddenly lost, and you look at your, your driving command and you say, Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. Think for a minute, though, like if your friend had never seen The Wizard of Oz, <laughs> they'd be like, okay, 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 who's Toto? <laughs> and why do I care if I'm not in Kansas? So story again makes all the difference. One more, probably the, the moniker of the postmodern age. What is truth? that we also know was said by Pontius Pilate 2,000 years ago. 
Stuff only makes sense in story. And I sometimes think we forget that in our lives in the church, we have this whole linguistic system, all these words that may mean things in general parlance, but take on a particular meaning in the church. So we can talk about stewardship or justification, grace, gospel, fellowship, justice, resurrection. I'm inclined to add Jesus. Did you ever find yourself late on a Saturday night um, procrastinating on your sermon, watching television? <laughs> oh, come on. You know you've been there. <laughs> And you're flicking around, there's like nothing to watch, except for the really, really fundamentalist preaching stations. And I don't know about you, but I'll find myself listening for a while. It's like driving by an accident, and I can't stop looking. <laughs> and I'll find myself thinking like, wow, same name, different God. Right, because there's a whole different story behind how that God interacts in the world. Um, and that's true of the words and the stories that we tell as well, that they make sense in the context of story. And so I think that if I were going to kind of pin down what the challenges of this generation are, why the church is in such decline in this country, not the whole world, by the way, and it's important to remember that the church is growing by leaps and bounds, particularly in the two-thirds world, but why it's challenged here is that stuff only makes sense in story, and we don't know our story very well anymore. It's like the biblical story has shrunk in our imagination. And not only that, but it's surrounded by so many other stories. These were just a few um, magazine covers I pulled off the internet one evening. Some of them are iconic, you'll recognize, some of them less so. But what occurred to me as I was arranging them is that behind each of them is a story uh, that taps into what the ancients would have called the good, the beautiful, and the true. That is, behind each of these magazine covers, there's a story and a, really a worldview about what constitutes the good life. What's worth saving for, striving for, sacrificing for? And it's not just the stories we're reading, of course. It's the television shows we're watching, and the clothes we're wearing, and the cars we're driving, and where we're vacationing. We live in the age of the competition of the meta narrative. Meta narrative is just a kind of fancy name for a really big story that you don't even think of as a story because you just assume it's true. We are literally saturated by stories. Um, think for just a minute about the power today of emblem or logo, right? A couple generations ago, an emblem logo, it made a promise to the consumer about the quality of a product. Um, emblems, logos, and we live in this kind of universe of logos now. Uh, emblems now still make a promise, but it's about the kind of quality of life that you can lead and the quality of person you are. Some researchers at Duke University uh, did a study not too long ago, and they discovered that, that the emblems we wear on our shirts or we see on our cars or our shoes or our laptops, that across the board, these emblems generate more and more of our identity, give us our identity, more so than the religious identification we often carry. I don't know if you're familiar with um, the concept of product placement. Remember that when people pay a lot of money to put products and characters' hands so that the lead character of the movie is drinking a Coke, not a Pepsi, driving a Ford, not a Chevy. Um, they spend you know, millions and millions of dollars on this. Do you know what the most frequently placed product has been the last 15 years? I'll give you a hint. Yeah. Apple, right. And do you know how much Apple has paid for that privilege? Nothing. Nothing. You know why? Because every director knows that if he or she wants a character to look creative, they just give that character an Apple product. Which, of course, makes me only more attached to my little Apple. <laughs> right? We're constantly living in that world of stories to the point that they've over often in our, uh, the, the imaginations of our people have often overshadowed the Christian story that they may or may not have even grown up with. So what I want to do with you for a couple minutes before kind of jumping deeper into cultural analysis, I want to think with you a little bit about what happens to church when you don't know your story very well anymore. And I want to suggest that three important things happen that we need to pay attention to. One, scripture loses its capacity to shape what I would describe as our performative identity. Now, that's another term I just made up. What I mean by that is that that sense of identity that, that shapes the way we act, the way we perform, the decisions we make. Again, um, the conviction is really simple. Most of our daily decisions are made in accord with an unconscious story or stories we often tell ourselves about ourselves, right? That's the definition of identity, the story we tell ourselves about ourselves. So that again, to borrow from the world of advertising, advertising is no longer about selling a product. It's about telling an attractive story. 
Think about some of the powerful stories behind some of the iconic ads or symbols we're used to. The Michelin Man, our product is so reliable that yes, we hire service people, but honestly, they're bored. They don't have anything to do. Or Michelin tires. This is one I remember, I don't know if this is accurate, but I associate it with Sunday afternoon football. And maybe it was just the demographic they were pitching tire ads to. Um, but as a kid, I never understood what babies and tires had to do with each other. Like, it made no sense to me at all. And then I had a child, and I was like, oh, this is all about safety. Right? The, the implicit story or promises here by Michelin that you'll keep your family safe. I was doing work around these lines with a group of, of largely of laypersons, and afterwards, one woman came up and she said, you know, I've been in business, I've been in advertising my whole life, and in my experience, she said, price point, that is what you actually price a product as, is almost never the deciding factor in a purchase. I mean, it, you'll, it, it matters, but it doesn't decide. The deciding factor is whether or not you see yourself in the story the ad is telling. So when you're looking at a car, yes, you're thinking about miles per gallon and what your loan payment will be, but what you're mostly thinking about is what does this car say about me? How does this car extend or enhance or shift the story that I'm telling myself about? And you're not doing that consciously, but unconsciously. Or when you're looking for a house, when you're, when you're buying a home, uh, and you find yourself walking into a home with one of the open concepts from kitchen to family room, and at the end there's a big uh, digital television, and you find yourself daydreaming and thinking like, you know, I can imagine that every Friday night, we're gonna make homemade pizza together in this kitchen. And then we're gonna eat it in that living room, we're gonna watch a movie together, and we're gonna be happy. And when you're daydreaming like that, the realtor's daydreaming, ka-ching. <laughs> right, because the truth is, you may have never made homemade pizza in your life. <laughs> but the idea, that story is so appealing, you're willing to really invest yourself in making it true. So if we don't know the biblical story, that means the, the metaphors and the images and the convictions and the worldview of scripture are not shaping that identity, that narrative identity that guides so many decisions we make about how we spend our money, our time, and our energy. And as, uh, as nature abhors a vacuum, so does human nature abhor a narrative vacuum. We cannot live without stories. If we don't know the biblical ones, Madison Avenue is more than happy to fill the gap. All right, second thing. Um, if we don't know our story, then scripture loses the capacity to furnish, another made-up phrase, what I call stories of reference. What I mean by that, stories of reference are not the big ones you watch on television or read in a book. These are all the little stories, the anecdotes that we're constantly telling each other. I mean, I'm guessing we already told a lot of those little stories just coming in and seeing people for the first time. What did you do over summer, or how's your family, or what's going on at work, or have you seen the show, or all that kind of conversation. And the reason those stories or reference are so powerful is because they help us share our lives with each other. I mean, the stories work because they take these big, amorphous thoughts, feelings, convictions, and they make them concrete and shareable. Right, so this is what's appealing about, about the, the shows we watch. We just, we, we latch on to them because they help us think about, I mean, you may never be in the situation these characters are in and often don't want to be, but they help you think about your life. Quick, quick example, how many of you have seen The Blind Side? Really great, feel-good movie, um, a, based on the true story of, or inspired by true events, depending on what you prefer, of Michael Orr, who played for a time for the Baltimore Ravens. Um, in the story, Michael is uh, a, a big, talented, athletic African-American who's homeless. He's adopted into a, the home of a white, wealthy family. They send him to a private school. They all expect him to be a great football player, and he seems utterly uninterested. And they can't figure out why. And then one evening, they're reading some of their favorite bedtime stories, uh, and they read the story Ferdinand and the Bull. Did you read that or have it read to you at one time or another? Ferdinand is this big bull that everyone wants to be a great bullfighter in, 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 Mex in uh, Madrid, but all he wants to do is sit under the cork tree and smell the flowers. And Sandra Bullock's character, Leon Tui, uh, discovers she's been telling herself the wrong story about her son. And at, at this point in the film says, that's who Michael is, he's Ferdinand the Bull. That's what stories do. They help us make sense of our lives, make them concrete, these things we care about so much, and that way share them with each other. Um, now, if we were going to do a little experiment about the story nature of our lives, I think we'd learn some, some interesting things. So imagine that we're going to leave this place, and for the next week, you're going to carry around a voice-activated recorder. Every time you talk, it starts recording, and at the end of that time, someone analyzes all the things you said. Right, be careful. 
Um, I think we discover three really interesting things about stories. One, we in fact tell them all the time. Even if you sort of know that, I think we'd still be surprised by the hundreds of little stories of reference we're constantly telling. Two, we would discover that although we grab these stories from all different settings, all different places, the news, the uh, television, family life, work, that the majority of them come from a definable set. That is, yes, there's tons of sources of stories out there, but we develop favorites. We go back to those sources that have been proven that in our experience have given us good stories of reference over and over again. So to kind of think about that, like I don't know anyone who prides him or herself on only watching one television show episode of a program each season. Right? I don't know anyone who says, this week I'm watching Two, two, uh, uh, two Broke Girls. Next week, though, I'm watching um, Scandal. And the week after that, like, we don't do that. We might bop around a little while, but then we find a favorite story, a favorite, and we keep watching it because it helps us, we identify with the characters, helps us think about the world. Um, similarly, I don't know anyone who listens to conservative news radio all morning and then just for fun, liberal news radio all afternoon. <laughs> like, maybe we'd be better citizens, but I haven't meant to be people who do that, right? We find a station, a channel. That's why we have presets. We go back to our favorites. Um, so we grab stories from all over the place, but most of them come from a definable set. The third thing we discover is that in everyday conversation, we almost never tell stories from the Bible as stories of reference. We don't often share biblical stories anymore the way we would have a couple generations ago. Now, if you're thinking about the last confirmation lesson you put together, or Sunday school last sermon, like they don't count, okay? You have to do that. I'm talking about an everyday conversation. It's odd to read about one more scandal in, in Washington, sex scandal in, in business or politics, and to say to your neighbor talking about that, did you see that scandal? You see that scandal? That reminds me of David and Bathsheba. It just does. Now, think about the political scandals, sex scandal, they do remind you a little bit about David and Bathsheba. We don't say that. We're more likely to say something like, that reminds me of Brad and Angelina. Right? Those are the stories that we're familiar with. So here's the question. If we spend uh, all of our time on Sunday telling a biblical story, and right, that's all we do. We read it. We preach it. The hymns are filled with it. The liturgy overflows with its imagery. We spend that time entirely wrapped up in the story, and then you never think about it the rest of the week. Why would you keep coming back? If you don't find those stories useful, if they don't inform the way you think and make decisions, if they don't come to mind as you're navigating the myriad of decisions we make, why would you keep going back? Why wouldn't you just watch reruns of your favorite television show? Which apparently more and more people are doing. Third thing, if we don't know our story very well anymore, then actually what goes on at church itself makes less and less sense over time. A while ago, I was at church, I was going to do the adult forum, but not preach, so I just got to worship, which was really cool. <laughs> and we got to that portion of the liturgy where we were coming to communion, and we sung, uh, sang together the Agnus Dei, Behold the Lamb of God, and singing and getting ready to go to, to communion. And I started thinking, um, how many stories from the Bible do you need to know for that song to make sense to you? Right, so you need to know something about John the Baptist, that these are the words John greets Jesus with. It helps to know that it's John the Baptist only in the fourth gospel and John's gospel. Um, I was talking about that once, and a colleague said, yeah, but why does John the Baptist in John's gospel greet Jesus with those words? And I had to confess, I wasn't really sure. Was it scapegoat theology? Was it Exodus? John draws on the Exodus church. Like, what's going on there? And I said, I don't know, but, and I almost never name drop like this, I promise but it was too good to miss. I said, I don't know, but I'm having dinner with Walter Brueggemann tonight. <laughs> so I'll ask him. Walter Brueggemann was coming to town to do some lectures. I happened to be the guy picking him up, took him to dinner. And at dinner, sitting with uh, Walter Brueggemann on one side and Rolf Jacobs on the other, like my, two of my favorite Old Testament scholars, I said, Walter, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, can you tell me why John's Gospel has John the Baptist greet Jesus with words, Behold the Lamb of God. What, what Old Testament tradition does it refer to? And you know what Walter said? I have no idea. <laughs> you know what I said then? But you're Walter Brueggemann! <laughs> like, <laughs> if you don't know, like who does? So I'm going to go with scapegoat. That's what I'm going with, scapegoat theology. 
Um, but think about that. So for most of our people who don't know any, mirror, any of this, these levels of stories, what does that song mean? It means it's time to go to communion, right? Which is not bad. It's not bad to have ritual action and, and music paired together. Um, but there's so much more that we seem to be missing. So I had my kind of own experience of this once when I was working on um, some material along these lines and I was working with a group of pastors in Iowa. It was the last day of a conference. I was going over my notes, and as I was going over my notes, I had plugged my uh, iPod in at the time. I just had an iPod to sync it because I had a four-hour drive later that afternoon. I wanted to download some of This American Life and, and listen away. Um, and you know if you have an iPod or an iPhone or an iPad now, you plug it into a Mac or PC, and iTunes pops up, and it starts doing the syncing. And sometimes, I don't know if this is still true, but back then, you'd plug it in, and sometimes it would start playing music like wherever he had canceled out the last time. And so it did, and it started playing Christmas music. Um, and the reason is simple. I have a ton of Christmas music on my computer because I love Christmas music. I'll listen to it at various points throughout the year, even. All right, I'm just going to do it here, especially during Advent. <laughs> did you hear that? Ooh. <laughs> it's a feisty group. <laughs> so the, and it's not just uh, sacred music. I don't know if that makes you feel better. It's also the popular Christmas carols, and the song that happened to pop up at the time was We Wish You a Merry Christmas, right? We wish you a Merry Christmas. It was Bing Crosby's one. You've heard that? We wish you a Merry Christmas, right? You know, like, okay, so yeah, that's my Bing Crosby. <laughs> so you know this song, right? You've heard it tons of times. In fact, I bet, I bet you know it well enough that you could sing it right here, right now, right? I've got the microphone. Don't, don't let me hanging, okay? Ready? We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Awesome. To you and your kin. Good tidings for Christmas and a Happy New Year. Great. Who remembers the second verse? So bring us some figgy pudding, so bring us some figgy pudding, so bring us some figgy pudding, and bring it right here. Third verse, we won't go until we get some, we won't go until we get some, we won't go until we get some, so bring it right here. Now just for a moment, don't you think it's kind of amazing that, that in the middle of September, we can call out of nowhere three verses of this Christmas carol. Um, it's the testimony of the power of song and story and all the rest. So I'm kind of doing what you're doing. I'm humming along, singing along as I'm getting ready for this conference. And all of a sudden, I get through the three verses, and it occurs to me. There's like this little question pops into my head that had never entered it before, which is just this short and simple. What the hell is figgy pudding, anyway? <laughs> Like, I, I realized I had, I had no idea what figgy pudding was. No idea whatever. But, but I did have an internet connection, so I looked it up on Wikipedia, uh, and I found all kinds of pictures. This is a figgy pudding. I found out that a figgy pudding is a white boiled pudding made out of figs. That's the easy part. That uh, was very popular in Victorian England and was one of the traditional meals served to Christmas carolers, right? Which, it made a lot more sense. As I began to get curious about this, I read a little more, and I discovered some other things that were also interesting, but I'll admit, a little alarming. I discovered that, for instance, Christmas was not always the family-friendly holiday it is today. For quite a while, especially after the Industrial Revolution and, and people working in factories all the time, Christmas was just another holiday. It was another break from the factories. It was a chance to let your hair down. It was a chance to get drunk. In fact, there was this concerted effort by uh, clergymen at the time, all clergymen, in the late 19th century to clean up Christmas, which was part of where that little story about St. Nick came from. That was written by a Episcopal clergy person. Um, and what I also discovered was that caroling was not always something that youth groups did for shut-ins. <laughs> <laughs> that caroling was actually the practice of people from poorer parts of town going to wealthier neighborhoods and singing in the expectation of receiving food and more drink, just what they needed, right? Which gives that third verse, when you think about it, a little bit of an edge, doesn't it? We won't go until we get some. We won't go until we get some, so bring it right now. Like, totally different. 
Like it kind of blew my mind because there's all this stuff behind the song that I didn't know anything about. And what I realized was that for my whole life I've been singing this song, right? For 30, 40 years I've been singing this song and did not understand two thirds of it. And it never bothered me. Right now, you know why we know this so well, because when you go Christmas caroling, you vary the carols not to get bored, right? Away in a manger, one house, holy night, another. You always sing, we wish you a Merry Christmas, though, because it's the closer, baby. <laughs> this is why we know it so well. So I've been singing all those times, and I did not understand two-thirds of it, and it never bothered me. And ever since then, when I'm preaching, especially when I'm guest preaching somewhere, and I don't know the folks in front of me very well, sometimes at all, in the middle of the sermon, somewhere along the lines, I'll have what I think of as now as a figgy pudding moment. <laughs> like, do they understand what I'm saying? Or are they missing big parts of it? Right? Are they sitting there thinking, like, Apaka, what? Did you just call the Holy Spirit a parakeet? Like, you know, what is going on, preacher? And the challenging thing is that even if they are thinking that, we will never know. We'll never know because, one, we live in a culture of politeness, right? Who else grew up with highlights and goofus and gallant? We know how to behave. We know what the right thing is to say as you're on your way out from church. And the right thing to say is, nice sermon, pastor. Good sermon, pastor. Right, we know what to say to be polite. Um, nobody wants to look dumb. If I don't understand the sermon, but the four people in front of me say, nice sermon, pastor, good sermon, pastor, good sermon, pastor, nice sermon, pastor, I'm not going to be the guy who says, nice try, pastor. <laughs> but next time, could you make a little sense? Because I'd really appreciate that. <laughs> right? I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say, nice sermon, pastor, and figure it's me. Like, I'm the one who doesn't get it. Third, and this is the one that worries me, I think we're kind of used to not understanding church. So many symbols, so many things going on that we don't really understand, and we've gotten kind of used to it. Right? It's like when I would sing Christmas, uh, Wish for Merry Christmas, didn't understand two-thirds, it still made me feel Christmassy. Right? I think the stuff we do, we don't get it, but it makes us feel churchy. We know it's Sunday. But imagine the, the end result of this church reality we may be living in. So I'm guessing every one of you at one time or another has either preached a sermon that or has heard a sermon that invited people to, invited the people listening to go out and invite people to come to church. Right? It's something like, you know, if, if people move into your neighborhood or there's someone new at work, certainly befriend them, help them out, and if it's appropriate, invite them to come to church. And imagine that they're actually doing it. This is the one that takes a stretch. <laughs> imagine they're doing that, and imagine the conversation that someone might have. So you might meet someone else and say, hi, I think you're new to the neighborhood. I think our kids are in the same grades. If, if you need help finding back to school materials or stores or where you want to go, we'd love to help. And oh, by the way, if you're at all interested in church, we go to a great one. We'd love to bring you. There's two services, early and late. Pick the one that can convenient for you, and we'll come by and pick you up. So, so far, so good. And then comes. But I, I need to warn you of something. You probably won't understand most of what happens there. But that's OK. Neither do I. <laughs> and I've been going there for 10 years. So what do you think? Do you want to come? Yeah, it's devastating. It definitely makes sense in story. And we don't know our story anymore. And that is the challenge of this generation of congregational leaders. This is what is where the church is dying. Now, um, how did this happen? And this is where I want to introduce that term, digital pluralism. Um, and I want to do that by way of thinking about information technology revolutions. Now, honestly, if you had told me 10 years ago I'd be fascinated by information technology revolutions, I would have thought you recently moved to Colorado and were taking advantage of the new laws there. <laughs> right? So I'm just letting you know, if it sounds like a little dull or something, be prepared to be surprised. Information technology is essentially the study of how is it that we capture and share meaning? How do we take hold of and share the things that are meaningful for us? And the folks who know a whole lot more about this than I do, will tell us that although there have been innumerable evolutions in the way we communicate meaning, there really have only ever been three revolutions. That is, three innovations in technology that changed absolutely everything. The first one, not surprisingly, is the development of writing. And you can think immediately what would happen. It gave human communication a depth and durability it never had. Previous to this, every human message had to be literally embodied, carried by one person to another. Um, and suddenly tribes become nations, 
and tribal religions become world religions. In fact, all of the world religions are in some way, shape, or form a religion of the book. The second innovation is movable type and the invention of the printing press. Because although writing adds a durability to human communication, it's so expensive to produce that there's really a relatively small quantity and very few people who are trained in reading and writing. Literacy is, you know, almost 100%. And movable type comes along, and again, it, it changes everything because it makes it affordable. It makes it uh, accessible. There's a kind of breadth to human communication that never had before, and it spreads wide and far. And again, changes everything. Two, again, quick examples. One, think about the impact of Thomas Paine's common sense pamphlets on uniting a relatively disparate set of colonies in the New World. Or an example a little closer to home for some of us. Um, it's helpful to remember that Martin Luther is not the first reformer. My kids in Western civilization were shocked to see how much he got slash borrowed slash stole from Jan Hus. They were a little upset by that. I had never told them that. <laughs> Um, so Luther's not the first reformer, but he is the first successful reformer. And by successful, I mean quite simply, he died of natural causes. <laughs> and Luther actually knows that there's something going on with communication. I always thought, I always thought that kind of having uh, diets and disputes and everything written down and, and printed and distributed was kind of commonplace, but it wasn't. Uh, and there's this big shift in the first year of the Reformation where Luther begins to realize the power of the printing press and begins to ask that things are distributed. So the 95 Theses, early on, he's not aware of this. It goes through just a few printings. But the sermons he preaches nine months later on the 95 Theses, he's gotten it. He sends them to the printer. They go everywhere. And that's really the start, in a lot of ways, of the Protestant Reformation. Um, it changes everything. The third evolution, or revolution, rather, is the one we're living in. And it's the advent of digital communication. And the chasm this one crosses is temporal. It's instantaneous access to almost anything that someone wants to put available. That there's this kind of onslaught of ready information that we'd never, ever experienced before. I mean, think just, you know, growing up, how fewer outlets there were for information and the onslaught now. And again, it's changing everything. Think about the way the internet has played a role in politics both domestically in terms of online fundraising and media campaigns and all the rest, and internationally, so that when people want to have an election in Sudan, they bring in people to watch and to communicate whether or not this is a safe and fair election to the whole world, because what's posted is available to everyone. It's again changing everything. So this is digital pluralism. Two quick complementary definitions. First, Digital pluralism describes a world in which there are multiple and competing realities, stories, convictions, perspective, worldviews, most of which are mediated by digital means. Pluralism now, not simply in terms of ethnicity, but in terms of political persuasion, religion, perspective across the board, pluralism by digital means. Another way to think about it, digital pluralism represents the exponential proliferation of the means by which to distribute and access information to the point of supersaturation. Remember supersaturation from like ninth grade bio class? I just remember Mrs. Hibschman, my, my uh, teacher, I think she was actually my chemistry teacher, holding up a plate, and on that plate was a dry sponge. Uh, and in the other hand, she had a pitcher of water, and she started pouring water into the sponge until it was sopping wet. And then she stopped, she said, class, that is saturation. And then she poured more, and the more water went in, the more water came out until the plate was pooling with water and it spilled over on the table onto the floor and then she stopped and she said, in class, that is super saturation. And that's the way a lot of us feel about information and narratives. It's not that we can't take more in, it's that in this onslaught, the stream, whatever's coming in, we feel like a whole lot more is going out. It's overwhelming. Two quick slides to illustrate that. First, uh, every Experts estimate that every five years, the amount of information we capture is tenfold what it was previously. Every five years, the amount of information we have available increases tenfold. So think about where we are now, where we'll be in five years or ten years, or maybe a little bit more manageable. Um, again, experts estimate that today we're subjected to more new information every day than someone living in the Middle Ages might have experienced an entire lifetime. It's just overwhelming and changing everything. And what I want to look at, actually, is, is a handful of shifts, of cultural shifts, um, that I want to talk about. So six, I think, in number. Um, one, 
and we've touched on this one already, we've moved from a largely single narrative culture to a definitely multiple narrative culture. Now, when I say single narrative, I don't mean to imply that there was ever a time where people only knew the Bible. Right? It's not kind of the Camelot of, of biblical imagination. What I mean is that the biblical story, although there were lots of stories, right? and you see this in Luther, he's, he's working with the Bible, but he also is referencing Aristotle and telling German folk tales. Like, there's a lot of stories in the air, but one of them holds the center of gravity. One of them is actually the touchstone for many of the other stories. In fact, if you were to get a PhD in English literature today, you would begin by studying the Bible. Not simply as great literature, but because most of Western literature does not make sense if you don't know all the biblical references that these authors simply assume their reading audience knows. Um, and that's what we've talked about earlier. We're, we're saturated by stories. Second, because of this sort of super saturation, we've moved from what I would describe as the age of duty and obligation to the age of discretion. Now, I want to make sure I don't use either set of those terms pejoratively. When I'm talking about duty and obligation, I'm not talking about something that weighs you down or is terrible or this kind of heavy obligation. I'm more talking about the sense that for a lot of, uh, a generation two, a lot of what we did, we did simply because we knew we should. Or this kind of unspoken, this tacit set of cultural expectations that you learned at home and at church and in civic society, and you didn't question them. You just did this. This is the greatest generation. They, the nation calls and they answer. Whether it's going to war or sacrificing rubber or you name it, it's just this sense of, of duty. Um, in the emerging generation, that's much, much less true. The question that the emerging generation asks is not what should I do, but what am I going to get out of this? What difference is it going to make? Now, the moment I say that, it sounds like, again, I'm treading on being pejorative, and I don't mean it that way. There's been far too much ink spilled about the emerging generation as egocentric or narcissistic. I want to kind of put all the value judgments to the side, and I want to think about the world they're growing up in, this world of unlimited choice and option and possibility and information and story. And in that context, you need to make decisions about what you're going to choose. Um, this, is the, this is back to the story of my friend Raleigh and the guy in the airplane. They had an overabundance of opportunities and were drowning. And so they asked themselves, the, the question they used to make their decision is, which of these activities are helping us be the kind of people and family we want to be in the world? That is not a bad question to be asking. Right, so this isn't simply crass individualism. When you have this onslaught of options, you need to exercise discretion. You need to make careful choices. Sometimes it reminds me of walking into a, a Hirschfields or Sherwin-Williams or Home Depot, and I'll naively say something like, we're interested in painting our living room green. And then they hand me the dreaded color wheel. <laughs> and I had no idea there were 248 shades of green, pea green, mint green, lime green, spring green, winter green. Like, I don't know about you, I find it overwhelming. How do you choose? Usually I give it back and my hands are like trembling and I'll say like, I was thinking like dark, medium, or light. <laughs> you know, it's this kind of overwhelming. But the, the new, one of the new phenomena that psychologists are talking about is, and maybe you've heard the phrase already, FOMO. It's the fear of missing out that particularly our, our young people are growing up with so many options that they have a very hard time making a decision because they're afraid it's not the right decision or the best decision. And even when they've made it, they enjoy it less for the fear of missing out on something else. We've operated in this culture with, with the presupposition that more choice is better. Right? The more choice is the better. And what we've realized, what psychologists have taught us, is that some choice is always better than no choice. But you get to a point where you're overwhelmed by choice and lots of choices are actually incredibly debilitating and decrease our happiness. Um, because the one thing that is scarce in this kind of culture of abundance, and we know here better than many places, this abundance is not shared equally or equitably. We know that. Yet we also know, compared to when our grandparents lived, we have more choices about what we'll wear or what we'll eat or what we'll do with our time or how we'll get there or all those things than they could have ever possibly imagined. And the one thing that's scarce in a culture of relative abundance is time. More and more people actually are haunted by the fear that they cannot do all the things they want, need, would like to do. And that creates this sort of mentality about return on investment. Does it mean something to me? 
Two quick stories, again, to illustrate that. So one, I was talking about this with Mark Allen Powell once, a New Testament scholar at Trinity Seminary in Ohio. Uh, and Mark said, you know, this reminds me of a recent visit with our daughter. Mark's daughter had come home. She's in her uh, middle 30s at the time, came home to visit, spent the weekend with mom and dad. Sunday rolled around. It was time to go to church. And Mark's daughter says, so I have to ask you, dad, why should I keep going to church when I don't get anything out of it? And Mark said, well, I'll give you three reasons. Or if you know Mark Allen Powell, I'll give you three reasons. <laughs> so much energy. Mark says, I'll give you three reasons. One, because God is worthy to be praised. Two, even if you don't think you're getting something out of it, the people around you are. Your presence enriches the worshiping assembly. And three, even if you don't realize it, you are getting something out of it. You're hearing the word of the gospel proclaimed, you're receiving the sacraments of our Lord. Right, those are three pretty good reasons when you think about it. But as Mark would be the first to admit, to this day his daughter remains unimpressed. Right, this was the clash of generations, the, the generation of discretion. Why should I keep going when I'm getting nothing out of it? And it's the answer of the generation of duty. I'll give you three reasons, because you should, because you should, because you should. <laughs> a colleague of mine is a pastor, a large church in Fargo, North Dakota. Talking about this, he said, oh my goodness, this helped me understand my last stewardship campaign. They were having a stewardship campaign at St. John's and at the two services, and at each one they were having a temple talk. Does anyone else do temple talks? Where you have someone who's not, I don't know why we call them temple talks, if someone could explain that to me. Um, I guess it's to say this isn't the preacher, it's not the sermon. Um, but they had two temple talks, two lay persons coming up, and their question was the same. Why are you giving to St. John's this year? Right, total, makes total sense. The Early service, it was a gentleman in his late 60s, and his answer was very clear and uh, compelling. It's, we, we're giving to St. John's because St. John's needs us to, because there wouldn't be a St. John's if we weren't giving, because God expects us to share and to be generous, and that's why we're giving to St. John's. A, a totally understandable, respectable, good answer. Second service, the person asked to speak was a young mom in her 30s, and she said the reason we're giving to St. John's is because St. John's has a great preschool, and that preschool has made such a difference to our children. Also a perfectly respectable answer for why you're giving to St. John's. But notice how different they are. One is that of a sense of duty, and one is that of a recognition of what they're receiving, what they're experiencing. That's that shift. To put it really briefly, the emerging generation will not go to church because their parents expect them to. They will only go if church helps them make sense of their lives in a meaningful way, helps them navigate their crazy lives in the world. Third, we've moved from a time when identity was largely received to a time when identity was, is now far more actively constructed. Now, truth be told, identity in most of Western history isn't even a meaningful category. For most of history, identity, you know your identity because of the family you come from and the work you do, and often those go together. Post-Industrial Revolution, the rise of a leisure class, a middle class, leisure time, identity pops up as this kind of new topic in Western culture where people start thinking about who am I and what should I be and what should I do. And, and you can see it in, uh, in magazines, you can see it in sermons, you can see it in philosophical tracts. It takes on kind of a new life and energy. So we've been wrestling with this question for the last you know, two centuries or so. Um, but truth be told, up until very recently, the sources from which you could construct your identity were pretty limited. Right? That is, the options you had for answering that question, who am I, were limited largely by your gender, your ethnicity, your level of education, and your economic status. And again, those four often were bound together. Whereas today, that's changed radically, dramatically in a very short time. To, to illustrate this, when my mom went to Gettysburg College um, 60 years ago, in addition to being a wife and mother, which was simply assumed, she really had two career options available to her. She could be a nurse or she could be a teacher, and she was a teacher. When my daughter Katie goes off to college in a couple of years, she will have an unbelievable amount of choices to make. She's already thinking about it in 10th grade. And, and Dad, I don't know if I want to be a veterinarian anymore. It's OK, honey, you have time. <laughs> Just the, the way she can make sense of her life is nearly unending. Um, and that's true in so many dimensions of our lives. In some way, when I think about that flip, I think about, you know, go back to my childhood, and when I turned on the TV, I had three main choices. 
the big three, and although they were different, they were kind of the same, like local news, national news, comedies, dramas, late night news, right? That three channels, the same thing. Um, today, so many channels, hundreds of channels, and I know what you're thinking, still nothing to watch on television. <laughs> Um, all these different channels. Now think about for a moment how many of them are, are niche perspective channels, right? News channels or sports channels or hunting channels or food channels or cooking channels or liberal media or conservative media. Or, you know, you can create an entire entertainment universe totally tailored to your particular interests and perspectives. And we haven't even touched on social media. In this kind of world, we don't simply receive identity the way we did for generations. I mean, for a very long time, most of our identity was given to us by our elders. In this kind of world, you have to construct your identity. And you ask any kid with a connection to the internet, and they are keenly aware of that, that they are building their identity piece by piece in the, in, under the gaze of countless thousands. All right, fourth. We've moved from a culture that highly valued tradition to a culture that much more now today highly prizes experience. And really that links to what we just said because what is tradition? Tradition is the way a society communally shares its identity. Right? We don't realize sometimes how important traditions are to us until someone changes them. So maybe you were visiting a roommate over Christmas or uh, with your boyfriend or girlfriend or it's your first Christmas when you're with a partner and all of a sudden um, you just find yourself in these ridiculous conversations like, wait, 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 wait a second, wait a second. You open up your Christmas presents on Christmas Eve and then you just go to bed? Like, what fun is that? Well, that is when the Magi came. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it makes no sense. But you didn't realize how much those traditions were offering you as part of a sense of not just what Christmas is, but who you are at Christmas time until it's challenged. So if we don't value, if, if we don't receive our identity, then tradition naturally falls in value. But there are some other things going on too. One, we lost a lot of confidence in institutions. And institutions have been the primary tradition bearers of our society. Watergate, Vietnam, clergy sex abuse, we've lost confidence in our institutions. But I think even more, back to our theme, is that we're living in this instant access world. Now, I have no way of proving this, and I'm sure it's wrong, but, but I kind of trace it all back to the TV dinner. <laughs> and, and I'm a little embarrassed to admit, I actually remember like salivating, getting very excited when I found out my parents were going away for the evening and we would have TV dinners and like Swanson's Salisbury steak. <laughs> like the green beans weren't cool, but that hard brownie in the middle, <sighs> right? I mean. It, what did the TV dinner represent? It represented freedom. You didn't have to prepare. It was just there waiting for you. You could start it. And then comes the microwave. Remember, everyone had to have a microwave. We still do. What does a microwave do? It boils water faster. Like, that's it. But it goes across the board. And then it continues on until we're between dishes and satellites and internet. We have this 24-7 world where what we care about is absolutely our most recent experience holds court. Um, for, for a very long time, the, the chief slogan in advertising was tried and true, right? This is last of the generations. You can count on it. It's tried and true. St. Augustine used this soap. You should use this soap. <laughs> that crazy. Or when, when, Mel when Melanchthon is writing his apology, he is bending over backwards to show that it is, everything they're doing is entirely in line with the tradition. This is nothing new. Right? New is suspicious. All of that's changed. I mean, the line today is the exact opposite. It has to be new and improved, or you're clearly not getting your money's worth. Um, and so we're constantly kind of thinking about our, uh, how do we validate things? How do we believe things are true in light of not what tradition tells us, but what our experience does? A couple years ago, when they came out with the, uh, the second version of Apple TV, it was, little, it was when they made it smaller and a little black hockey puck size, 100 bucks, I thought, cool, I have a lot of stuff on my computer I'd love to put on the TV, so I bought one, I brought it home, and then I was kind of embarrassed to realize it didn't work with my tube television <laughs> yet. <laughs> had to have an HD TV. Uh, and so I took it back, kind of sheepishly, and, and said, you know, I, I, I didn't realize this, do you, uh, do you still, do you, do you sell an adapter? And he said, no. I said, was there a third party like Belkin that makes an adapter? No. I said, why not? And he said, frankly, we didn't think anyone had those TVs anymore. <laughs> 
you know, I got a little defensive, <laughs> so, t talking about preserving the environment. <laughs> you know, and, and, and he came around. He was like, we're patronizing me. He said, oh, well, that, that's that's really quite admirable. <laughs> I felt like slapping him. <laughs> Take that, Sonny. <laughs> you know. Um, but I think that's kind of the mentality we're in. Like if it's not, it, things aren't designed to be obsolete so much as they're designed to be out of fashion. And so we're, there's constantly this treadmill, we can never quite keep up whatever is the latest and the greatest, greatest which means traditions of very little value practically, which does not mean we don't like the idea of tradition. Actually, I think the idea of tradition is seen in real resurgence. Who's seen the NFL jerseys? Right, the retro jerseys from earlier. Like there's this hearkening back, this nostalgia that's kind of overwhelming us, or Antiques Roadshow. I, mean, I think part of the popularity of Antiques Roadshow is, is that we may not have many long or deep historical stories, but, but we're thrilled to think that our chair might, you know, or our pen might. So we buy tradition because we've abandoned it ourselves. I grew up in Lancaster County, which is like the capital of a word that didn't even exist when I was a kid, antiquing, right? It's this pastime now. And when I was little, there were no antique stores. You know, as I was thinking about that, why? I think it's because everything we owned was an antique. We just called them hand-me-downs. <laughs> you know, it was like my grandmother's bed and my grandfather's desk, my older brother's pants. <laughs> it was just like, it was passed down and you just sort of thought that, that you came on. So we like the idea of tradition, but we don't want to go back there. Or the royal wedding. Like, I don't know, I mean, the fascination on the royal wedding. I don't know any American, any true-blooded American, <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> who wants a monarchy? Uh, but there's this idea, or even maybe a wedding, but this idea that it's cool that someone does. Like we like the idea of church, or church weddings for that matter. Second church I served in, in Audubon, uh, when I got there, it was a year state of supply by the Synod as they were going through some significant kind of shifts in their makeup and identity, um, suffering in every number possible except in weddings. There were like 30 weddings booked when I got there. And what I discovered was very quickly, and I did everything I was taught at seminary, I promise you, like trying to get people to come to church and teach them faith through the wedding counseling and everything. And what I discovered pretty quickly was they were not interested in church. They weren't interested in Christian marriage. They were interested in a church wedding. And this church happened to have a beautiful wood altar and, and stone building. They wanted pictures to be able to show their kids, see, we got married in the way you're supposed to do it in the traditional way. So it's not that we don't value tradition, it's just that when we're like making all the decisions that we're confronted with every single day, we're far less likely to look to our traditions than we are to look to our iPhone. All right, fifth. I want to suggest too, we've moved from a time when our sense of identity was, was pretty coherent to a time when our identity is much more segmented, even fragmented. Now identity, again, interesting term. Um, Psychologists will tell us that identity itself is something of a necessary myth. That is, we think, okay, we're one person with total integrity, and I'm that person wherever I go and whatever I do. And it turns out that's not usually the case, that we act and behave and think even differently depending on the groups we're around and what we're doing in our social peer groups. But it's necessary because we can't function well if we don't have a sense, a holistic sense of who we are. So we tend to think of ourselves, you know, as a whole person. But really, we're a variety of persons in one body. We have a familial identity, and a work identity, and a school identity, and a, a civic identity, a political identity, a church identity, and increasingly, a socially mediated identity. This is part of why it's really challenging being an adolescent today. I mean, adolescence is the time, typically, at least since the Industrial Revolution, where we've been kind of put it upon our youth to create their identity. And again, most of that was received, it's now actively constructed, but now it's actively constructed with a million people watching. This is, this is the challenge of, of growing up. You, you cannot, I mean, teenagers have always complained about how boring home was. But they also, whether they said it or not, it was a refuge. It was a sanctuary. For a little while, nobody was watching. Now with a timeline or a Twitter feed or your wall, every time you express yourself, and this is the rule of the age, express yourself, tons of people are watching. This is where cyberbullying comes from. It's not that we didn't have bullies before, it's they couldn't pile on with a thousand other comments. Right, it's, it's a really challenging time. That's who we are today. All these different realities 
telling us about ourselves. I came across this bulletin uh, on the internet once. It's, uh, it's the cover of a funeral bulletin for a university professor. And you can, as you look at it, you realize it's a mosaic picture. And when you zoom in, it's a picture of all this professor's students and colleagues and friends and church members. It's pretty moving, isn't it, when you think about it that way? That, that we are the sum of all these relationships. Um, that's who we are. And increasingly, it's difficult to hold all those together. When you saw the same people at church and the PTA and at work and in the square you were shopping at, the supermarket, you could hold that sense together. Where now, increasingly, it's just harder and harder to have a holistic, non-fractured sense of identity. Sixth and last on digital, cultural, uh, digital pluralism, um, we've moved really quickly from being consumers of information and culture to being active producers of information and culture. This is often caught by the phrase Web 2.0. Um, what they mean by that is back in the day of Web 1.0, which nobody called Web 1.0, <laughs> All the information was coming one way. It was coming to you. It accessed all the information that would come to you. And if you're going to choose a symbol that highlighted Web 1.0, it would be the hyperlink. Remember, when you're reading a web page, and some words are highlighted in blue or purple. And, and you learn very quickly, if you click on that, it'll take you to another page. And there'll be another dozen links. Click on any of those, they'll take you. That's the World Wide Web. It just keeps spreading out. And you have all that information coming to you. Web 2.0 happens <clears throat> when people realize there's enough bandwidth <clears throat> to let people not only receive information, but to send it, to comment on it, to create it, to produce it. So these are the comments you leave on Amazon. You're now creating information. It's the letter to the editor you write. It's the product review. It's the blog post. It's the Twitter feed. It is this incredible advent of social media where the story now is not the story, it's what we're all saying about the story. This is, I'm sure you've been, I shouldn't say I'm sure, perhaps you've been following some of the early debates. Um, and what was become important again is not what candidates say, but the way we react to it. We now, as a mass, have become the authority. This really, uh, it struck me after the, at the last election cycle when Obama and Romney are debating. And for the first time ever, at the bottom of the picture, you see the, the podiums, you see the heads, the people talking, and underneath it, there's a constant, do you remember? A constant Twitter stream, where what we realize is, is what they said kind of mattered, but what we said about what they said mattered even more, right? That's this world of, of incredible participation, because in the world of social media, Collaboration, participation is everything. And Frank, Frank Rose, an editor at Wired Magazine, has said, the concept of audience itself is growing outdated. There are no more audiences. Participants will be more like it. Everywhere in your life, you're invited to participate, except on Sunday morning. Now, those of who care about, and I count myself as one about the liturgy, will remind us that it's highly dialogical. There is kind of give and take between the presider and the community but our parts are all scripted, right? We're, we're told what to say. And it's not that those words don't mean something to us, but it's not the active solicitation of participation that we experience everywhere else in our lives. That's, in a nutshell, digital pluralism. It's this digitally mediated world of almost unlimited choices where the church is just one more option. And yes, that is the late Steve Jobs coming down the mountain with two tablets. <laughs> All right, so that was, that, was, that was my year away, right? That was the year of kind of the independent research. And when I got to the end, you can begin to understand why I started kind of rethinking what I was doing and wondering about what I was doing. Um, and the thing that struck me might be what's really, like, none of this is new. This is the world you live in. But some of the categories and frameworks help organize a little bit differently. And what struck me was kind of immediately, how do we miss these changes? How do we kind of, like, what was I doing not paying attention to this? And I think there are actually some really good reasons. I think one, because church leaders tend to be people who value duty and have received a lot of our identity and love tradition. That's who we are. The tradition has worked for us. And so we carry it on proudly and devotedly. Um, I think secondly, it's, it's, it's working for just enough people that we can convince ourselves it's not really a crisis, or at least not a crisis that we're responsible for responding to. 
Um, two, three percent loss over a year, that's not too bad. We'll cut a little here, maybe the sexton will be half time, we won't get an intern. Over a generation though, that's devastating. But we don't live by generations. We live week to week, month to month, maybe annually when we fill out our parochial report. That report which is becoming increasingly parochial in both senses of the word. Um, and I think the third thing to keep in mind is that it's difficult to trade what we know for what we don't know. We were given really good tools and practices. And it's one thing to say, I'm not sure they're working as well. It's another to say, I'm just going to try something totally different. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. That's really fear-inducing. OK, last thing I want to do before we break for chapel. Just briefly, I want to kind of move from the macro culture of the world to the micro culture of our churches. And to do that, I want to talk about three unintended consequences. <clears throat> unintended consequences is a phrase that's usually used in the realm of political science or economics. And it simply to summarizes the reality that whenever you do something, whenever you change something, whether it's introduce a monetary policy or make a new law or create a social program, there are consequences to whatever you do. And many of them are just what you'd expect, expected. But there are also always unintended consequences that set things in motion you didn't imagine. Sometimes there's a positive. You're surprised by how well things worked or things that happened you hadn't foreseen. Sometimes they're less so. But either way, over time, those unintended consequences collect. They accrue and they demand your attention. They have to be reckoned with. So I want to look at three elements of our congregational church life <clears throat> and the unintended consequences that have accrued. First, Christianity in North America was very much embedded in the culture. And a lot of good things came from that. Um, when you remember again that, that the social service, I'll just again stick to my tribe for a moment, when, when, every single day in this country, one out of 50 people, 2% of the whole population are be cared for by institutions started by Lutherans. And you can go down the list of Episcopalians and Presbyterians and Roman Catholics. That's incredible, like the impact. And you only have that kind of impact when you are, in fact, embedded in the culture, when you're trusted. So all to the good. The unintended consequence was that we became pretty dependent on the support of the culture. I don't think we realized how much the culture was helping us tell our story. Um, <clears throat> this is a, when I was in the sixth grade, at uh, James Buchanan Elementary School in Lancaster. I remember how excited I was when I got to be one of the magi in the Christmas pageant at the public school that we were a part of. Uh, this isn't a picture of me, in case you're wondering. <laughs> but, but when I looked, when I Googled, you know, public school Christmas pageant, most of the pictures were black and white. We don't do that as often anymore. There are pockets which, that persist, but by and large, we don't. And, and really, we shouldn't because we live in a much more religiously diverse world than we did. I mean, I'm sometimes surprised and a little embarrassed when I realize that my children know more about the world's religions than I do. And they know that because they have friends in those different religions. So my daughter, when she was in the fifth grade, uh, I played on the basketball team, one evening at supper table taught the rest of the family about Muslim customs of dress at a level we'd never learned before because one of her friends one of her teammates, one of her friends, was a member of the basketball team, couldn't wear the school uniform. And so the accommodations they made, and Katie started teaching us about the background and what it meant and why, like that's the world our kids are in. And in that kind of world, I can't imagine the God of Jesus Christ wanting us to sort of force our story on everyone else. That's not the God of manger and cross. Um, but do we act differently, recognizing that we don't have the school system teaching the story it once did? Or for that matter, the larger culture. Remember, anyone remember the Andy Williams Christmas story? <laughs> After he died a couple years ago, I saw a PBS special. I, did, I had no idea of just how influential this was. For 25 years, top-rated holiday program, entertainment program, it, Andy Williams and his brothers taught the American public the Christmas story through readings and song for a generation. Um, those are gone. They have, they have withered. And I, I don't want to overcast this. This isn't about trying to paint a picture of a hostile culture. Really, it's a, it's a, it's a de democratically indifferent culture. Um, it's not that they're against us, it's that they're not necessarily gonna help us. I don't know if we realized how much support we had in getting people to come to church. And again, the question is, do we do things differently even though the world has changed? Second, I wanna talk a minute about the professional, professionalism, but also the professionalization of the clergy. Um, one of the great assets 
or benefits of the churches that came out of the Reformation was a high valuing of an educated clergy. That's why we have colleges and seminaries and all the rest. Um, and that's all to the good. I don't want anyone leaving saying, yeah, that guy at, at, at Lutheran said, don't be professionals. That's, that's not what I'm saying. It's to recognize that with the professional, professionalism came a professionalization. A generation ago, it was not uncommon to talk about the three professions, medicine, law, and religion. Um, and, uh, and it's not that I'm, I have anything against doctors and lawyers. I think they're wonderful people. But I do want to ask, when do you go see a doctor or a lawyer? When you're sick or in trouble. Right. And why do you go? Because you know they know things you could never know. And I don't mean you're not smart enough to go to med school or law school. I mean you're not going to. You need an expert, the one who knows stuff that you will never know so that you can just trust and do what they say. Is that really the best image we have for what congregational leadership's about? We know things nobody else knows, and we hope when they're really in a bad time, bad spot, they'll come and ask for our expertise. Of course not. Um, see, the, the trouble is that when you get to the absolute professionalization of the clergy, you create this cult of the expert. And the flip side of the cult of the expert is a cult of dunces, the people who don't know. In our tradition, we're very polite about that. We call those people lay people. <laughs> Now look, we don't mean it. We don't mean it that way. And anyone who's been to seminary, which is pretty much almost everyone here, can be quick to remind me that laity comes from the Greek word laos, which means the people. And I just want to ask you, how many people who haven't been to seminary know that? <laughs> or use the term that way? How is layperson used in the common culture? To describe the amateur, the dabbler, the person who doesn't really know. We use it self-deprecatingly. I'm just a lay historian, don't ask me. So a, a student of mine, now a pastor for a number of years, after talking about this, he said, you know, after my last annual congregational meeting, my church council president took me aside and said, Pastor, every time you say the word layperson, I hear the word muggle. <laughs> now, I don't know if you know that word muggle, it comes from the world of Harry Potter, one of the influential stories for the emerging generation. Um, in Harry Potter's world, there are two kinds of people. There are the magical people, the wizards, the witches, Harry and his friends, and there are the non-magical people who are called muggles. <laughs> Pastor, every time you say the word layperson, I hear the word muggle. That's a problem. Third, um, we take Sunday worship really seriously. And this is one across the board. You ask any of our people what's the most important day of the week for the Christian, they will answer immediately, Sunday. In some ways, that's incredibly positive. We are uh, we're honoring the commandment to keep the Sabbath holy. And we know that it is, to borrow the old words, meet, right, and salutary that we gather together around word and sacrament. But the unintended consequence over time is that Sunday has become the performance of the faith. It's become the big game, the day. And the challenge is that it's to the exclusion of the other days. In fact, when I talk with, and I'm just going to use the phrase everyday Christians to try and think of other terms than layperson. When I talk with everyday Christians about this, connecting faith and life, it's not long before one image keeps cropping up. It's the image of a bridge. The bridge they cross from their everyday lives to their church lives. But as they talk more, it's typically not that kind of bridge, the Golden Gate. It's more like that kind of bridge. <laughs> and it's getting harder and harder for them to cross. In fact, some folks uh, at uh, Andover Newton Seminary about 20 years ago did a study, did some conversations with everyday Christians around this. And at one point in the conference they were holding, they asked people to engage in a creative exercise. They said, they gave them paper and crayons and, and pencils and said, draw a picture of your experience of the connection or disconnect between your faith and life as you experience it now. Uh, and they, they drew this picture uh, and, uh, and I, I'll show it in just a second. I'd been, talk, I'd been talking about that study for a while, and a friend of mine said, I have that slide. And so uh, he, I said, send it to me, and he did. And what struck me was a couple things. One, you can see the chasm where their own body is the bridge. Like I'd known that, but the two things I hadn't known that really stuck out to me, one is which world are they touching? Right, their world. In fact, they'll often talk about the real world and church world, the one they know. And where's the sun shining? over church. You know why? Because when we're at church, we know God's happy with us. Right? That's the idea of what it is to be a Christian. It's to go to church. The rest of our lives, ah, we're not so sure. And I think unintentionally, we perpetuate that notion, that divide all the time. 
So a quick illustration, one I borrowed from David Miller, who teaches at Princeton uh, University from his book, Faith at Work. I um, want to just share a quick couple questions that Miller often does. Uh, so how many of you at the beginning of a new uh, program year, like we've just had, Rally Sunday or the beginning, whatever it is, how many of you will find some way to recognize the people teaching Sunday school? Install them or pray for them or whatever it might be. Just raise your hand if you do things like that. Right, a lot of us do that. Um, after you have an annual meeting and elect members to the Board of Elders or the Vestry or Church Council or the session, again, how many of you have some way of recognizing them, praying for them, installing them? And when your youth groups do mission trips, how many of you remember them in prayer, or pray them, commission them to go? Okay, last question. How many of you in middle March into April have all the CPAs in your congregation stand up and pray for them, commission them? When you realize that over the next few weeks or months, they're gonna be working 60, 70, 80 hours of work a week and the work they do keeps the rest of our world moving. Now, is praying for Sunday school teachers and council members and youth wrong? Of course not. But when that's all we pray for, or dominates our prayers, then you can understand why people think church work is a calling. Everything else, not so much. By making Sunday so important, we've unintentionally devalued everyday life. Last story to close with. You may have heard this one. It made the rounds on the internet a few years ago. Um, spring of 07, the Washington Post does its own little social experiment. They set up a street musician in one of the stops of the DC Metro. Metro's the subway station in, in Washington. And they video record to see how many people will stop to listen to the music. Uh, a thousand people go by and nobody, almost nobody stops. Uh, and, and, now, what they reveal then is this is what they see. They, they see a guy in an army jacket and a baseball cap with a violin case open, a couple groby bills there. Turns out this is not your average street musician. It's actually Joshua Bell. And he's playing his three and a half million dollar Stradivarius. Uh, and later he said the acoustics in the subway stop were nearly perfect. And he's repeating a 45 minute concert that he'd given two weeks earlier at the Boston Philharmonic to a sold out crowd where the cheap seats were a hundred bucks. Wow. And nobody stops. So the question the Post staff writer asks is, have we trained our people to detect beauty, to expect beauty anywhere they haven't already been trained to look for beauty? In the article, he references another experiment where they took, you know how when you're in restaurants, they'll often have works of art hanging around and sometimes there are prices like you can buy them and take them home. So they, they take out of the frames a number of priceless works of art from the Metropolitan Art Museum and they hang them in a restaurant nearby and they'd previously been tracking how much time people look at the artwork and then they do it again with the masterpieces and there's no difference. People don't know they're sitting around masterpieces. So the question you ask is, have we, have we trained people to detect beauty anywhere other than where they expect beauty to be? Can they see art if it's not in a museum? Can they even hear music if it's not surrounded by a concert hall? And the question I want to ask that came out of this kind of year of pilgrimage into the culture that was my own culture, but I didn't even know it, was have we done something similar in the church? That is, have we trained our people to detect the presence of God anywhere other than where they expect God to already be? Have we helped them sense God's presence in their lives if God is not accompanied by pipe organ music or surrounded by stained glass windows? And if we have not, then what kind of future can we expect? What kind of future really do we deserve? That's an absolutely terrible place to stop. <laughs> It's like those churches that sing only one stanza of a hymn, which works sometimes, but not with a mighty fortress. You know, our old satanic foe who seeks to work as well on earth is not as equal. Stop! <laughs> but it is a good time to break and go to worship. Let's go, let's go pray and worship together, and then we'll come back and talk a little more about how we might respond. See you in a bit. Yeah, you